now that we're a couple of minutes in, I'm going to kick us off. Um, my name is uh, Robin Webster, and I work for a climate communications organization called GSEC. Um, and I'll be your host for this webinar, this Carbon Gap webinar, which is exploring the role of soil carbon in EU climate action. Or to be more specific, thinking about how we bridge Europe's soil carbon gap in a way that's safe, effective and just which is, a, as we know, no small no small task. Um, Carbon Gap are report, uh, launching a report today, uh, which is exploring this issue and based on a large number of uh, interviews with experts in the field, which I think is a fascinating and brave thing to have done. Um, and what it explores thinking about soil as both a public good in social, political and cultural terms, but of course, as part of uh, its role in food production, in production biodiversity, but also as a private resource. And crucially, as a part of the conversation we're having now, we're exploring soil's, soil role in carbon sequestration. And soil uh, is as an integral part of um, global climate models and also regional models, European models, national plans for how we're gonna reach net zero. So it's an incredibly important part of the climate change conversation. And one that I think is, um, is not thought about enough about what it re really means in reality. Um, I, I, I read a quote recently in a scientific paper that said, after 10,000 years of releasing carbon dioxide by clearing land, humankind proposes to create massive sinks on land within the next few years. And that's the level of the challenge that we are that we're facing at the moment. Um, and, and the statistics are, are not with us in many ways. EU soils are a, are a net source of carbon at the moment, losing more carbon than they gain. Land degradation is affecting two thirds of European land. And terrestrial carbon sink, the land available we have for absorbing carbon around Europe, is sinking. And this is also happening in the broader global context. According to one study, the world's soils have lost 133 billion tonnes of carbon since the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago. So how to address the soil carbon gap and the soil health gap in a safe, effective and just way is an incredibly important conversation to be happening. Having and there are incredibly different visions out there for how to do this. And one of the things I found really fascinating about the um, report that's being launched today is it dives into not just the debate about what we're trying to do. So comparing those priorities about mitigating climate change as versus food production as versus biodiversity protection. And then as a step on from that, how to do it. So and the big crucial conversations about whether market mechanisms and the commodification of soil is the way forward. Who pays for soil carbon conservation? Who's responsible? So we've got a fascinating and uh, uh, diverse panel discussing this today. But I'm going to kick this off by uh, passing the floor to Kyla Cohen, who is a co-author of the Carbon Gap Report, and she will present their findings. Thanks so much, Robin. Um, and to Lydia, who's going to share some slides. Um, so I'm Kayla, a senior researcher at Carbon Gap and an author of this report alongside my colleague, Sylvain. And I'll summarize some of our findings and present our key principles for European soil carbon governance um, with the note that these principles can be transferred across jurisdictions. So as always, Carbon Gap's goal is to oxygenate the debate with a view to unlocking progress. Soil carbon and its role in achieving Europe's climate goals is hotly contested and for good reason. It's a carbon removal method with many co-benefits and we know it's imperative to advocate that the EU soil becomes a net remover of carbon. Um, but how to kickstart kick and sustain this transition required research. So we interviewed 14 soil stakeholders with diverse expertise to understand the key issues of soil carbon governance today, pooling their recommendations for positive ways forward and mixing that with our literature review. Our sample included soil carbon MRV providers, NGOs, private sector intermediaries, academics, and representatives of farmers and landowners. Next slide, please. Thanks, Lydia. Okay, so that's just an overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I'll dive right in. So the first finding of our research was a characterization of the issues facing European land stewards. EU land stewards face a perfect storm. Uh, the viability of their business is threatened by extensive land degradation, as Robin has already outlined, 
and rising production costs for fertilizers, seeds, and energy. Their returns are increasingly unpredictable due to climate change, creating an existential risk for, for small and medium-sized farms, which are already sidelined due to trends of industrial farming and also land concentration. Perverse incentives such as cap payments for the cultivation of drained organic soils continue to drive unsustainable trends, with which all coalesces in a succession challenge where younger generations are opting out of farming to pursue more financially secure careers. But, but it would be missed to treat farmers as a homogenous group especially when it comes to action on climate change. It's true EU soils are net emitters of carbon, but whose responsibility is it to address this? We found interviewees approached this question through equity principles. For example, a farmer would have a higher responsibility to help mitigate climate change had she the financial capability and also the cumulative carbon footprint. Um, to, to support that. The physical conditions of their land and the scale of positive impact they might have was also flagged as key criterion. If we go to the next slide, um, I'll explore another key finding, which is this idea of multiple priorities for a limited uh, amount of EU land. So interviewees' opinions on the extent to which land stewards should be tasked with climate mitigation varied based on which priorities they valued most for EU land over the next few decades. We found eight underlying value areas, which together paint a picture of trade-offs between biodiversity, yield, climate mitigation, and social goals. Although these are not necessarily trade-offs or mutually exclusive, we found that optimizing for any one or combination of these priorities led to drastically different visions for the future of soil carbon governance. If we go to the next slide, we'll I'll, uh, explore what carbon gap made of all of this. So ultimately what we realized was um, soil governance really um, works with the donor economics approach, which is originally uh, put forward by the economist Kate Rortworth. And in it, there's a kind of social foundation um, which must be respected and an ecological ceiling that must not be overshot. So here we put forward a vision um, of soil carbon governance, which is firstly, to protect the social foundation that's underpinned by soils, um, which ensures that the, the minimum soil health thresholds are met. Um, and for us, that really means that there's no alternative to mandatory requirements for member states. So what does that mean? The EU's 2050 soil health goal must be legally enshrined so that member states are held accountable. There's also within this kind of, once the social foundation has been kind of ensured through mandatory minimum requirements, there's a lot, there's ample room for policymakers to be quite creative and ambitious in incentivizing land stewards to go above and beyond um, and increase soil carbon on their, on their land. Um, we thought that a more tailored approach which would empower land stewards with choice and also member states with flexibility would be uh, appropriate in this case. And then finally, we also recognized the power of private finance to expedite the widespread changes that Europe needs for its soils. Um, and here we advocate for the EU to attune its regulatory environment accordingly. So, a few ideas of how this works out in practice. The EU has to make many decisions um, over the next few years, such as whether to take a results-based, activity-based or hybrid approach. If they take an activity-based approach, which activities should be incentivized and how might this differ across European soils? If they take a results-based approach, 
is there cheap and accurate enough soil carbon uh, measurement to support this? What is incentivized, whether it's activities or results, does have a bearing on who pays for carbon removal in soils and what do they get in return? And the reality is these decisions have to be made by policymakers under suboptimal conditions, under pressure and without scientific consensus. Interviewees widely disagreed on the efficacy of certain land practices, and it follows, therefore, which practices should be incentivized by the government. On the other hand, many interviewees advocated for light touch soil carbon MRV um, or monitoring and reporting and verification to ensure that the EU does not contract carbon tunnel vision and doesn't spend more public money than public benefit derived by the data collected. Accordingly, Carbon Gap suggests a hybrid approach where farmers could voluntarily sign contracts with the EU to practice specific activities thought to be effective, but there would be um, measurement checkpoints to kind of ensure that they are being effective and to uh, improve their efficacy over time. It's also worth noting that if the private sector wanted to um, invest in results-based approaches, um, then their claims off the back of that need to be heavily regulated. And this is a key part of Carbon Gap's advocacy work, which is the like-for-like -like principle. So, for example, any compensation claims off the back of soil carbon removals must be restricted to residual biogenic emissions. Overall, we hope that this uh, report can provide policymakers and thinkers in this space um, with new visual and conceptual tools to keep in mind the key complexities, implications and trade-offs of the decisions that they make in bringing about a bridge in Europe's soil carbon gap. I'll hand it back to you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you so much for the fascinating presentation. Uh, right, I'm going to start introducing our um, uh, panel now. And the first person to speak on our panel will be Jean Ferreno, who is a farmer working in France and part of the European coordination of Via Campesina, which gives a voice to peasant farmers in Europe. He will, will also explore which priorities should take precedence when it comes to governing agricultural soils before 2050. Jean's advocacy centres around agroecology and food sovereignty with priorities such as fairness, democracy and social empowerment as paramount. The food sovereignty movements of which he's a part critique and aim to transcend the neoliberal vision of the world of commodities, including the establishment of a soil carbon market. Jean will therefore also discuss the cons of commodifying soil carbon to mitigate climate change. And I believe as a farmer who, for whom the world doesn't stop, he's speaking to us from his car. Well, over to you, Jean. Thank you, Robin. Hello, everybody. Um, so I will firstly introduce quite quickly. Uh, so Via Campesina is an international movement defending small scale farmers. Um, and first, I want to say that we thank Carbon Gap for this excellent report and that we mostly agree on the fact that we need to change the way we care about our soils, especially in Europe. Uh, we definitely need to make that better uh, because we're losing a lot of this really important capital for the future. Now, the question is how and why. Um, about carbon farming, we see a few issues that are, in our opinion, quite important to deal with before we proceed with any policies or any plans in the Europe about um, storing carbon in, in soils. The first one being land use. Uh, we know we have a limited amount of land available in Europe at the moment, and we definitely have to choose what we want to do with this land. Uh, is it producing food? Is it producing energy? Because now we have more and more competition between farmers and companies producing, for example, solar panels or other kind of new um, green energies. And these energies need land. So that's the first issue. And then you also have now the issue of carbon farming. If you store carbon in the soil, it will somehow impact the, the food production. So the question is, we need to think about what use we want to do with the land we, ha we have and what priority we want to, to, to fix as, um, as a society. Um, and we already have examples of places where actually uh, food production is being replaced by other production, especially energy or, or carbon. 
Um, another issue we see with this land, with the, the storing carbon in soils is the question of the time, the time lapse. Most of these projects are around, let's say, 10 years projects, five to 10 years project. This is really short compared with the carbon cycle in the atmosphere. And we think that if we want to have a real impact on climate change, um, unfortunately, storing carbon in soils will not directly impact the fossil carbon cycle. It will change the biomass um, carbon cycle, but that's quite different. Um, another point that's quite important for us in, in Via Campesina is the question of finance and well, the link with capitalism. We fear at the moment that the push for um, the carbon market is a, a new way for capitalism to, to have new markets for speculation and for financial actors to invest in. And we are not really sure about how to say them on a real volunteer, uh, the, the, the will from these actors to really change practices. We think they mostly want to make money out of this new market. And farmers are, well, small, mostly small scale farmers will be completely in a non-balanced um, link with these, uh, with these huge financial actors. So about land, obviously, as I already said, but also, for example, if farmers accept to make some contracts with big companies, they might have some issues or problems after that because the, the imbalance of power is really huge. And we think that at least this should be controlled by the by public policies. Basically, we we need the public policies to to make some kind of rules about what we do with carbon and how we can sell carbon credits. Um, if not, it will become something really dangerous in a way for farmers. Um, another thing, but that is, I think, a point that's quite shared with the other panelists today, but I will let them talk about that also, is the fact that we think offsetting is not a solution. And in any case, all the things we do with carbon, being storing carbon in soils or any other techniques to, to remove carbon, should be, as we say, to for, for the last quantities of carbon that really cannot be changed, but it's offsetting from like companies that are trying to offset their classical emissions should not be uh, authorized. We, we think it should be something limited to really the, the last impossible to abide, to abate um, emissions. Uh, and in order not to be only pessimistic, let's say, to put a little bit of, of proposal also. Uh, so as La Via Campesina, we definitely again, I say, agree with the fact that we need to have better soil policies and techniques in agriculture so we protect our soils better. Um, the important thing will be for us to have a fair transition because at the moment, most farmers trying to change their practices are not really supported by the, the policies of the European Union. And we think that should be fair. And so it needs time. Uh, farming is a process that needs time. So if we want to change practices from farmers, we have to have something that's planning on the long term so they can really adapt to the, these new demands from society, basically. And I guess we'll have time to get deeper into that later. So I will hand it back to Robin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, I'm going to move us on to our next speaker. Uh, it was Andrew Boise. Andrew is the Chief Impact Officer at Soil Capital, the agronomy firm that launched a regenerative agriculture transition program, certifying its climate impact in 2020. It's the longest running such program in Europe. Andrew has led the development of this programme called Soil Capital Carbon, which has now seen more than a thousand British, French and Belgian farmers enrol, achieving close to 200,000 tonnes of verified reductions and removals and enabled the disbursement of some four million euros to farmers in performance based payments. So I'm going to hand over to you, Andrew. Thanks so much, Robin, and to the Carbon Gap team for the great report and the um, platform today to discuss it. So as an agronomy firm, um, it probably won't be a surprise that many of my thoughts align with Jean's and I have quite a lot of sympathy with the perspectives he shared, but I'm going to go a little bit further and hopefully point to some of the solutions that we see as addressing uh, some of the concerns that Jean has raised. I'm also going to talk about the priorities for governing um, agricultural soils as a first question and then touch on the pros and cons of, of commodifying soil carbon as well in the few minutes uh, I have just at the beginning here. So in terms of that first provocation that the Carbon Gap team has put to us, you know, which priorities should take precedence when it comes to governing uh, our agricultural soils? I'd give quite a direct answer personally. And my answer would be that we need to produce the nutrition 
that we need while simultaneously restoring soil health. And I've chosen my words quite carefully there. Um, I'm talking about nutrition, not output. I think yield was an objective that we set for the agricultural system after the Second World War. Um, and I think it's time to move on. Uh, it's also not about calories, which is, I think, the word that the Carbon Gap paper suggests. I'm talking specifically about nutrition, um, which implies looking at our diets from a health perspective and uh, evolving them. And it implies looking, therefore, as a consequence at the crops that we grow uh, uh, as farmers to feed uh, ourselves. And I've chosen to focus on soil health there because I hope uh, all of us on this call uh, know that focusing on soil health more broadly, putting more carbon in the soil as a result, does contribute to climate mitigation in the right circumstances. But it also, of course, helps agricultural soils be more resilient to extreme weather, improves biodiversity, and so much more. And I focus on that word simultaneously because soil capital certainly believes that there doesn't need to be a need, sorry, doesn't need to be a trade off in uh, between farming in a way that's productive, producing you know good nutrient dense food and farming in a way that restores soil health. But crucially, and I'll come back to this, I think in the discussion a few times, achieving that requires us to align policy and governance between the food system as a whole and agricultural, um, the agricultural sector as well. And then looking at this second question about commodifying soil carbon you know I, i'm not sure i would um, sign us up to commodification as a as a goal but let me take you through the journey that or the thought process that soil capital has been on um to develop the carbon program that, that robin um mentioned at the beginning we start by thinking about farmers first of all and and kudos to the carbon gap team for really unpacking the context in which farmers uh, operate today you know, we need to get real about the nature of transitioning to, let's say, regenerative agriculture practices. That is a journey that involves a lot of risk for a farmer. And in the context of the tiny margins that we heard about earlier um, from Kayla and, and the volatility, it's really clear to us that farmers must be financially rewarded for taking that risk. And when we started to think uh, as a humble agronomy firm about well, what can we do to to generate new financial rewards for farmers going on that journey. We did alight on carbon as a starting point for um, broader uh, soil health improvements. Why? Because we see carbon as a leading indicator of soil health. And there's a really nice section in the Carbon Gap paper that, that unpacks that and highlights that. And although there are plenty of challenges and problems, we do see that on the many, many benefits of improving soil health, carbon is relatively easier to quantify at scale and relatively easier to monetize internationally. So that's what took us on that journey. But of course, and this comes back to sort of Jean's, uh, some of Jean's points, we see very clearly uh, as soil capital, the need to ensure really careful boundaries and safeguards in how this is done. And I'll just highlight a couple and we can come back to them in the discussion. But the first one is about where the money comes from. And I think there are opportunities that we're not making enough of to ensure that the money comes from those whose interests align with producing the nutrition we need while simultaneously restoring soil health. And I'm thinking in particular there about the food and beverage sector who have a, a dual dependency through their supply chain connections as well as supply chain emissions to maintain the right balance between the two sides of that coin. Uh, the carbon gap paper does refer to this uh, potential source, but but I think it warrants sort of unpacking more. And then this concept of tunnel vision is the other area where I think good safeguards and boundaries can be put in place. Um, you know, you can design payment systems that ensure that agriculturally productive land stays as agricultural productive land, even while you focus on improving soil health and carbon in the soil. And you can monitor yields to ensure that that is being done. 
And finally, again, maybe this is something to unpack later, but we have quite a strong view on this question of whether you should be rewarding just activities or just results or something in between. Uh, and I think, you know, to summarize, I would caution quite a lot against going to either of those two extremes. Uh, we see significant downsides on, on either side, but I'll leave that to unpack later on, Robin. Thanks so much. Uh, and uh, for our final member of our panel, I'm going to pass on to uh, Jessica Sientz, who's currently a DPhil student at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. She specialises in the relationship between food systems and climate, working to optimise land use while simultaneously feeding a growing population and reducing emissions. And she'll be exploring whether we can conserve, conserve soil carbon and prioritise food production. What's Europe's top priority for EU farmland pre-2050? Over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Robin, and thanks to the Carbon Gap team for invi inviting me today. Um, so building on what, what Andrew has said, um, and Jean as well, um, the prompt of the debate or of the discussion today was, what is Europe's top priority for EU farmland pre-2050? But I think it's too reductive to ask what the top priority is. The reason why this is such a difficult issue is because the land sector has to juggle multiple objectives, and sometimes these objectives are at odds with each other. The way I see it and what my research focuses on um, is that the, the central global objectives are that we have to feed 10 billion people by 2050 globally, reduce emissions in line with the Paris Agreement, and halt natural ecosystem loss. And this is on top of sort of more intrinsic um, local values like preserving local biodiversity and, of course, improving farmer livelihoods. And soil health is undoubtedly necessary to achieve all of these goals. But the question needs to be, what are the implications of pursuing interventions that prioritize soil health or building soil carbon, um, such as practices labeled as regenerative, at the expense of these other goals? Um, it's important to remember that the EU does not exist in isolation. It's part of this global trade network. Um, so Europe's decisions have effects that ripple through the rest of the world. Um, so we have to identify and consider these trade-offs. Now, practices labeled as regenerative in the name of soil carbon sequestration can provide many benefits, but there are also potential challenges. And so it's our job as scientists and policymakers to know how to reconcile these pros and cons. Um, for example, the understanding of permanence of soil carbon stored long term is still highly uncertain, and there's you know wide agreement uh, among soil scientists on that. Um, for example, we know that no-till improves soil resilience and builds soil carbon while the soil is not tilled, but no-till just actually means that you till the soil less frequently, so maybe every three to five years instead of every year, and when the soil is tilled, a lot of that carbon gets re-released. Um, and also nitrogen is the limiting factor in building soil carbon. So if we're talking about, you know, reducing dependence on um, nitrogen inputs, um, the sequestration potential is even more limited. Given these uncertainties, among many others, um, I think we have to be careful of placing emphasis on soil carbon um, as a mitigation strategy, because it might take focus away from interventions that we know would reduce emissions, such as, you know, in livestock enteric methane inhibitors, in crop production nitrification inhibitors, using renewable energy on farm, etc. Um, so one, one last thought is that um, at my previous role at the World Resources Institute, I worked on a report where we looked at a climate neutrality strategy for the Danish land sector. Now, in Denmark, there was a big push to reduce livestock production, scale up regenerative practices, biochar, biofuels, the whole nine yards. Um, but Denmark exports 90% of its pork, and most of it goes to China. So if that trade stopped, China would just get it from somewhere else, and probably more, most likely they would get it from somewhere else that produces pork less efficiently, um, and it would increase pressures to convert land for agriculture elsewhere. So actually, pork production in Denmark is valuable because it prevents the need for land clearing elsewhere to make up the difference. 
Now, cover crops and crop rotations and these things that we know build soil carbon are already pretty widely used in Denmark, and that's a good thing. But the benefit to the climate comes from the resilient soils and productive agriculture, and not necessarily from the soil carbon that might be stored. Thanks, back to you, Robin. Thank you so much. Really fascinating. And uh, we now have a good 20, 25 minutes to have a good conversation, which I think should is a good thing because there's a lot to get into. Um, I thought I'd uh, start the conversation off with a, with a sort of, I guess, a positively oriented question. This is probably mainly for Jean and Andrew, um, uh, but of course it may be for others. What do you think are the ingredients for creating a mass mobilization of land stewards, farmers, those who are in stewardship of the land, to farm in a way that bridges the soil health and soil carbon gap with the urgency that we need? A big question, but I thought I'd start with a positive one. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to put their hand up to be the first person to dive in. I'm I'm happy to go first, Jean. Um, didn't see you unmute uh, immediately. So the key ingredients for a mass mobilization, well, um, as you said in your introduction, Robin, we're now working with, uh, as soil capital, over a thousand farmers who are in their own way uh, attempting to transition their um, farming practices in this direction. Um, I think I'd pick out three key ingredients, if, if that's the sort of framing of your question. I think um, I, I think the first one is about role and identity. Um, you know, again, going back to my earlier comments after the Second World War, we told farmers very clearly through the policies that we set that their job was to feed the nation and feed Europe. Mm. Um, and that's what they've done very successfully. Uh, and we... You know, if, if we're to change um, how farmers uh, farm, then I think we need to clearly and consistently um, agree on the change in their role. Um, and I think this does actually lead to a lot of identity and cultural issues um, that, that Jean may be able to comment on. Um, but I sort of mean it in a, in a more, even more fundamental sense, because that would cascade into changes in policy and indeed changes on um, policies around farms that would cascade back into sort of how we, you know, for instance, on diets and how we um, farm. So I think that's the first thing, the role uh, that we see uh, for farmers. The second I've mentioned earlier is we need to be really clear that we must reward farmers for taking the risk of changing how they farm. And this must be sort of unambiguous, no conflicts in different aspects of policy and market interaction that that affect farmers so they don't see see trade-offs and i think finally i would highlight knowledge you know uh, farming in a more agroecological way is much more knowledge intensive than farming in a chemically dependent way and getting it right is much more knowledge intensive um because you have to harness nature um to solve your problems rather than harnessing chemistry uh, or, or or big machinery necessarily, and so access to the right technical support, the right right advice, the right peer examples from other farmers who've who've been through um, the learning curve, I think is really important. Thank you so much, uh, Jean. Are you happy to come in on this one? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Actually, two of your points were my points, so I will just underline them again. The, we need help for transition, as I said already. Uh, thank you for re reminding us that the, the agricultural policy in Europe has really has been controlled and since World War II going in a direction that's been decided politically. And basically the cap and all the other subsidies that you can get in Europe are definitely orientating farming towards a direction that at the moment we think is not the right one because it's, it makes farms disappear basically and it also has a huge impact on, on the environment. Uh, so we definitely need to change that and i think the first thing to do would be to align policies because when you look at european policies it's like the cap is doing exactly the opposite of what other policies are supposed to be doing so at some point we need to align maybe the policies together so we go in one clear direction uh and in that training obviously is really important uh we also agree that basically making agriculture in a way that's not harmful for the environment and producing healthy food is definitely more technical and complicated than making a uh, more classical, let's say, industrial agriculture. Uh, so we need a transition um, and we need help for that transition and it will take time. And we'll say it again, In farm, you cannot change things in farming like that because we work with seasons, we work with nature, so change will take time. So that's 
maybe another point to make it even more urgent because it will take maybe 10 years. So we need to start now. Um, I would just add one point. Uh, I think we have an issue of numbers at the moment. Uh, the question is, we don't think in India Campesina that it's possible to have 1% of the population in Europe being farmers producing food for the 99% that are not producing food. That That's not viable in the long term. Uh, so we have a really strong campaign in Jack and Pesina saying that we want millions of farmers back in Europe. We want more farmers. And that's, we think, the main solution. If you want practices that respect the environment better, and if you want to enhance the quality of your soil, there is no secret. If you want to reduce the use of tractor, then you need more people working in the field. It's mathematical. Uh, most of the technique that we talk about to make farming more sustainable implies more people working on the field and smaller farms. Uh, so that's what we think is the solution. Most members of Via Campesina are actually small scale farmers working on small farms with often more people working on the farm per hectare compared with other systems. But that is gonna be a big social change. We need to link again cities with the countryside and that's a huge problem at the moment. Uh, most people are not aware of the reality of farming. And we often see people with really good ideas coming with policies that are completely disconnected from the reality of farmers because they don't know what's going on in the field. So I think we need somehow to have more farmers and to link more the city with the, the countryside. And hopefully this will lead to young people willing to become farmers because in the end, that's a fantastic way of living. But at the moment, there is this kind of image of being a farmer is terrible. You don't earn any money. It's really harsh and et cetera, et cetera. So we need to change that. So I would say if we talk about like changing, as you say, like mass mobilization, I think that's the first thing to do is to get people to understand better what's going on in, in farms uh, and to make more link between the farming sector and agriculture and rural areas and big cities. And at some point when people will discover what's going on, hopefully they will somehow change their practices so we can have a better world farming system, basically. Thank you. Thanks so much. A bit of inspiration from you both. Um, uh, I've got a question that's related to what to your uh, presentation, Jessica, but I think actually be really also interested in Andrew and Jean's sort of perspective. I guess on the sort of straight answer to this question is if you perceive a trade off uh, between climate mitigation through land use and food production uh, between also with biodiversity and socio political goals, all these different goals that we're trying to throw onto this this one system. Like, do you? I'd be interested. I think you sort of answered this implicitly in your presentation. Perhaps I'd be really interested to hear your answer to that, Jessica. And actually, also from the other two panelists as well. I'd be interested. In. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, like I said, absolutely there are trade-offs in a system that is this complex and has this many actors. And, you know, it's not like fossil fuels where we can come up with, uh, you know, alternatives that get the job done. We have to eat. And to produce food at the moment requires land, unless anybody, you know, maybe vertical farming, but that can only get you so far. Um, and we know that prioritizing biodiversity or in the livestock sector, preserving or prioritizing animal welfare has trade-offs um, with, you know, the emissions intensity of food products and also the, the land footprint required to feed a growing population. Um, my supervisor here at Oxford, Harriet Bartlett, and her, um, her supervisor from Cambridge, Andrew Balmford, have many papers on this, on these trade-offs. Um, but the thing is not everything has a catch. There are some things that are, you know, more or less wins across the board. Um, like I mentioned earlier, things like cover crops and, and no-till, that with cover crops, there's a cost factor. And the reason why, you know, cover crops are not done everywhere all the time is because it it there's, you know, an economic, uh, a financial uh, need. Um, but we have to, you know, identify what what these synergies are and pursue those things. Um, and the my kind of hill to die on is that anytime our intervention results in less food being produced per hectare, um, we have to consider the opportunity cost of that because the food has to come from somewhere. And so, if you know, if I think, for example, we can. The EU maybe can can look at what's going on in the UK. I don't know if anybody has um, looked 
in detail about the kind of uh, EU common, uh, the cap replacement called ELMS, um, which are the farmer payments, you know, cap pays only for production, pays based on what you produce. And, you know, that there are problems associated with that, which is why um, ELMS is just going completely in the other direction and basically only paying for nature, only paying for biodiversity. Nowhere in the ELMS payments document do they mention food production or greenhouse gas emissions. And so, you know, the, the biggest payment you can get is for taking land out of production and planting trees. And so at scale, that's obviously not sustainable. And so we have to strike this balance of, you know, basically producing food without destroying soils while reducing emissions. And it's, yeah, there are, there are of course gonna be trade-offs, um, but if there weren't, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, I don't know if Sean or Andrew wants to jump in, and uh, particularly if you've got anything controversial to say, um, uh, to sort of give it, give your perspective on that question, or we can move on to the next. Just very briefly, I don't think it's the controversy you asked for, Robin. Of course, there can be trade-offs. Those have been really eloquently outlined by both Jess and Jean. Um, you know, agricultural land being turned over to forestry or to energy is is just a really easy couple of examples. But let's not be distracted. So, so those do need to be clearly seen and and managed and thought through. But let's not allow that conversation to distract us from what Jess also said, which is that there are plenty of opportunities to achieve multiple goals at once. Um, and and you know that that's where we're trying to focus which is to um, enable and incentivize food producers farmers to continue being food producers farmers without you know sacrificing any productivity while also increasing their contribution to the environmental services that that we that we need out of land as well awesome thank you so much um i think i'll move us on unless sean wants to come in on that one um yep very very quickly just to say that um in Jacob Business, we, we believe that the, the production is not a problem. The current food production on the planet is more than enough to feed everybody, to feed actually 9 billion people. The problem is a question of access to food. And that's something really important we have to say. That's what the UN is always saying. It's not a question of producing more. We're already producing more than enough. The question is how to share what we're producing between everybody. Uh, people that are suffering hunger are basically suffering hunger not because they don't have access to food, but because they cannot pay for this food. And that's a huge difference. And we think that the the solution would be to prioritize again food. And the good example that you just used, Jess, is about the, um, the use for energy, for example, to produce biofuels. This is a good example on why in the end, if, if that this is a problem for us. If we start using crops to produce energy for cars, then obviously we need more land and we need more food production because then we're using part of this food for not feeding people, basically. So I would like to make it a little bit wider, the, the debate. The, the question for us is a social choice of what we want to do with the, the biomass we produce, basically. Uh, it's not only about replacing, for example, uh, food production with solar panels, but even when you produce, for example, canola or something like that, do you want to use it to make oil for human consumption or do you want to use it to make a biofuel? And that's a political choice that has to be done. And obviously, if we want to replace all cars in Europe with biofuels cars and biofuel planes, then we won't have enough land for that. So that's a question of what we want to do with the the the, the food we produce. Um, so yeah, just to say that we, we think that that's a, that's a huge topic. And at the moment, as long as basically finance or money is driving the choice, then it will go to where it's the most interesting in terms of, of money making. And at the moment, it's really more interesting to produce energy than food. I see farmers around my place that are currently stopping producing food and putting solar panels because they make way more money from electricity production than food production. So again, that's a social choice. As a society, why are we putting more money on energy than food? I don't. I personally don't understand it, but that's the case at the moment. So, just to put that into the debate, that some there is also this part of economical, global economical context. And as Jacques Campesina, I'm going to use a bad word, I think, but we think that we need 
control and public control on markets. And we are basically against free trade because we think free trade is basically leading to this kind of issues. The, the kind of thing where land will be used by actors that have more money to produce things that will create more money. And food is not a priority at all for these actors. So somehow we need control on, well, trade basically, and on what we do with our land. But that's another debate. And the European Union at the moment is not at all on that line. Thank you so much. I'm gonna ask another question, which is, uh, I guess, more about the imperfect world that we're currently living in rather than the one that we wish we were living in. Um, uh, and this is a question about offsetting um, and the sort of international climate process that's going on as well and the role it plays in that. Given the huge issues of soil carbon as a mitigation strategy, not, not least that it's not long term and is a biological process, not a straight carbon process, risks embedded on embedding unfairness in farming, appropriation of land, etc. Should the COP28 climate process seek to announce curbs on straight soil carbon offsetting and instead support agroecological farm systems reflecting the complex nature of those systems? So should we just be going in there to... Uh, saying no to offsetting or can we see some places where it might exist I don't know who if anyone would be willing to pick that one up Andrew perhaps that might be a question yeah I'm happy to hi I, this came from Vicky Hurd I think hi Vicky um look uh, there's lots in that question I, I'm I'm gonna park the COP28 component of it uh, having been involved a bit in the COP processes if we if we agreed today that we want something out of COP28 that hadn't already been started some months ago I think um, we'd be sort of misreading how it works, but but I take the the thrust of the question. The way I'd the way I'd answer it is actually to look at what's now happening in Europe and European policy, and maybe that is a building block into COP twenty eight because there are various bits of the European policy puzzle which are somehow moving in the direction that you're asking. I think, Vicky. So you've recently had um, one policy called the Green Claims Directive which started out to protect consumers from bad greenwashing claims from companies, a, a laudable aim. And in its latter stages through the parliament, there was a really important um, amendment made, which basically resulted in um, a law being agreed that means companies will no longer be able to claim a product is climate neutral, especially when that claim has been delivered through offsetting. Now, no mention specifically of soil, but offsetting generally. So I'm, I'm, I'm pointing at the sort of um, the role of offsetting and underpinning pinning claims there. And, um, you know, I think one other important uh, building block in the sort of European policy puzzle is more on on the side that does speak directly to, to, to so called carbon farming and, and soil carbon, which is the process to develop a European certification for carbon removals, including in in soil carbon. And that's very much trying to address many of these thorny issues and ensure that what is done with soil is high quality. And again, in, in some of the re most recent parliamentary debates, even last week, as I understand it, that regulation was amended to link it to say that anything that is done with soil um, from a carbon removal perspective, must um, adhere to the Green Claims Directive. Meaning, I think, that the central premise of your question, you know, can soil carbon be used for offsetting? From a European policy point of view, I think the answer is becoming no. Um, now, maybe I've misread some of the details, misunderstood, especially on the carbon removal certification side, because that's just last week. Um, but I think it's worth highlighting that because, you know, these are these are developments happening in different parts of the policy spectrum. But when you join the dots, I think it's starting to um, speak to what, Vicky, you're talking about. And the final thing I will say is that I, I personally, we at Soil Capital, don't think that this means, right, there's no, there's nothing to be done in mobilizing private sector investment to offer the financial rewards that farmers need for improving soil carbon and soil health. Quite the contrary, we continue to think that um, driving this within the food and beverage system can be compatible with the sort of broader food system change that I think all of us have been talking about so far. Um, so that takes us down the sort of supply chain and the scope three um, route, which I mentioned earlier. Thank you so much. Uh, so either of the other panelists wish to jump in and have a quick 
um, statement on offsets or yeah. Jessica? Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just say that. Um, so when I was at the World Resources Institute, I was involved in the greenhouse gas protocol uh, land sector and removals guidance, which is a corporate um, framework for basically how companies with land based products in their um, supply chain should account for emissions and removals. Um, and we explicitly do not um, allow offsetting. Um, the draft guidance is is up. It's you know still a work in progress, but um, yeah, you can check that out. Um, but and then I I was in charge of the chapter on um, data quality and uh, data collection, and so we had to come up with sort of what are the rules for reporting a removal let's say your or or even an emissions reduction and and i think this is um relevant to to sort of what what andrew does um, with soil capital where like let's say for example you are a company that is buying wheat and you say oh well i get my wheat from this farm that's doing xyz things um and because of those things we want to say that our emissions factor is like this instead of the global or national emissions factor. And so in order to make that claim, whether it's lower emissions or attributing removals, um, you know, you have to prove it basically. You have to say, um, you know, you have to have basically peer reviewed kind of data to back it up. And in the case of removals, you have to be able to guarantee that it's permanent, additional, you know, all of those things. And, um, you know, many people in our working group, um, which are representatives from companies, will say that, you know, you're just putting up all of these barriers to, to being able to make these claims. But I, I see them as necessary safeguards. You know, if if you say, oh, you know, uh, my this farm where I get my stuff, you know, they do no-till. And so I want to, you know, claim removals from that. Um, you have to you have to prove it uh and so and so that you know and then adding offsetting on top of that is just it's another layer of complexity and uncertainty and um makes it more difficult to be proven i'll leave it there thank you so much we've got about a minute before we're passing on to our final speaker sean i don't know if you want to come in for a minute yeah my answer would be really quick yes uh, and uh, just to add that um, as ECVC, we joined a campaign called Real Zero Europe that I encourage some of you if you're interested to check it up. There is a website. It's a group of different NGOs based in Brussels mainly. Uh, we're working on the CRCF uh, proposal from the European Commission. So it's the Carbon Removal Certification Framework that basically is enabling offsetting and creating rules for offsetting in Europe. Uh, so yeah, I will not take more time now, but if you're interested in offsetting, we're completely against offsetting and this Real Zero Europe campaign will develop a lot of arguments about why this is not a good solution and why we should oppose any offsetting at the moment. Thank you so much. Um, for, for, for a final question, I was going to ask what you would all do if you were in charge of Europe for a day, but unfortunately you've run out of time, so you're not going to get to be in charge of Europe for a day. Um, my apologies to those questions that we haven't had time to answer. Uh, I get the feeling that we could have kept going for another 40 minutes or so. Um, so, but thank you so much for all your really rich contributions. And as to sort of close us off, I'm going to pass this on to Sylvain Zales from Carbon Gap. Yeah, thank you, Robin, <clears throat> and thank you for all the panelists for this very good and, and rich conversation. So uh, I will try to summarize a little bit what we have discussed uh, to try for messages. Um, so I think this whole um, uh, issue or, or, or opportunity maybe of uh, soil carbon starts from uh, the fact, the fact that we've mentioned in the introduction, which is that uh, we've spent a lot of years uh, working to degrade the soil carbon content of um, of EU land. So we have depleted the natural carbon stock of this land by implementing um, intensive agriculture and other practices uh, such as land use changes. So um, 
this is an interesting starting point because we know this stock has existed in the past and we can try to restore it, um, which is a, a proof that we can do that in, uh, in theory. Then, uh, of course, initially the uh, premise of uh, Restoring soil carbon and, and storing more carbon in the soil is very attractive because of all the synergies that we've mentioned. Uh, in, in, it is clear that when you increase the soil co carbon content, uh, especially in soil that were depleted, uh, you typically increase a lot of different metrics and, and uh, services that the soil provides, such as water retention and uh, resilience to erosion, um, fertility, and that's what makes it very attractive. These are the, the, the co-benefits that we often mention. So uh, up to here, this is like a no-brainer story, uh, and which is why it has got a lot of attention. I guess the conversation we're having today and the report we're putting out today uh, tries to highlight that there are limits to this exercise. The first limit comes from um, this experience we've had in the past where we optimize the use of soils for a single function, like yield, for example, uh, or it could be others. That's where we start to cross that ceiling we have in the do not, which is like you start to exceed uh, one of the function uh, and then you, you start to have negative um, externalities uh, actually on the other dimensions. Uh, there are other, uh, so these are like more um, limits that we should acknowledge in the policy, but then uh, as Jean mentioned uh, very well, there is also limits uh, that needs to be um, uh, acknowledged with the price signal of the different activities and services. Uh, you can have policies that recognize the different services that provide minimum thresholds and so on, but as long as you have a price signal that is completely distortioning the decision making process for the farmer, with the example, for example, of the solar panels that Sean put forward, uh, of course, the, the, the farmer is uh, exposed to, uh, um, uh, let's say, signals that are uh, orienting the decision in a very clear way. So just to say that the policies we are all uh, hoping for, I guess, would take into account all these dimensions, but need also to take care on how they translate into price signals. Um, then also the report and the conversation uh, have highlighted how um, soil is very particular in that uh, because it is like at crossroads of uh, different um, services, needs, um, uh, cultural values uh, for societies, it is overlapped by different layers of policy that are pulling in different directions. And that's the problem of consistency uh, that I think uh, we've also touched on uh, during the debate when uh, Andrew and Jean in particular mentioned that if we are to achieve a significant transition in the farming world, at least, we need a clear message and we, we need clear direction. So that's where policy needs to align and we need to stop having, uh, you know, contradictory uh, signals across policy uh, that makes the decision process just uh, more complex. Um, so then I think coming back to the very uh, beginning of this webinar and the quote that uh, Robin brought to us, uh, I think it really reveals the issue with this because the, we see the problem is complex and it has many dimensions, but unfortunately it's even worse than that because of scale and speed that we need. Uh, we need to move very fast and at large scale uh, if we want to have an impact on the climate crisis. And that's where it gets tricky because it needs that you need to um, motivate uh, a lot of farmers and land stewards to make the transition uh, in a very short amount of time. And I think Jean mentioned several times uh, something that is very well known in the sector, which is farming is not a, a, a fast moving industry just because of the nature uh, of the system, as he put it, uh, but also because of all these different dimensions. So I think there is a real challenge here for policymakers to design the right incentives if we want to have uh, achieved this scale and speed. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll maybe uh, stop here, not to, to exceed the time. Uh, there's uh, uh, a lot to, to be said because the, the conversation was very rich. Then maybe I will wrap it up with uh, trying an analogy because uh, it was interesting to see 
uh, how the panelists uh, refer to the changes we are asking farmers to do, which is moving from maybe more chemical-based, simple uh, management practices to much more knowledge-intensive practices uh, to move towards regenerative agriculture. And maybe that exact change, uh, same change needs to happen for policymaking. Moving out from simplistic uh, approaches, optimizing for a single factor towards way more comprehensive uh, approach uh, where you uh, um, account for all the different dimensions of the problem, uh, which is what we have tried to represent with the with the do notes that uh, Kayla presented in the beginning. So thank you very much to all the panelists. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Robin, for moderating, and uh, I'll hand it uh, over back to you to conclude the webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a really fascinating conversation and a sort of interesting balance of agreement and disagreement uh, and a conversation that we definitely could have kept going on for another hour or so. Um, so as we're now two minutes past, um, I'll draw a close to the webinar and thank you all to those that have participated.